a brief introduction uh, for our speaker today. Dr. Schwinard is co-director of the Andre Barbeau Movement Disorders Unit at the Notre Dame Hospital of the Centre Hospitalier Universitaire de Montreal. My apologies if I mispronounce anything. <laughs> Involved in research since 1997, his uh, major interests are in the diagnosis and treatment of movement disorders such as Parkinson's disease, dystonia, Huntington's disease, and Tourette syndrome. He acts as principal investigator in numerous studies, exploring the efficacy of treatments and the genetic aspects of Parkinson's and Huntington's disease, Tourette, as well as dystonia. A major part of Dr. Schwinard's time is dedicated to the diagnosis and treatment of movement disorders with an emphasis on Parkinson's, uh, Tourette, and dystonia. Due to his commitment and knowledge in the field of dystonia, his opinion is often sought by his peers. And I must say Dr. Schwinard is a wonderful supporter of the dystonia community. He's always supporting the needs of our uh, Quebec dystonia community. So uh, we're very happy uh, to have him here with us today. Um, sorry, a few uh, disclaimers and reminders <laughs> before we get started is uh, we want to remind everyone that this is a webinar that aims to provide general information about dystonia and DMRF Canada is not recommending any specific course of treatment for dystonia. Always speak with your doctor about the right course of treatment uh, for you. Uh, this presentation is being recorded and will be shared with you when uh, available online. Uh, there should be closed captioning and uh, please feel free to turn on or off uh, the closed captioning. Also about the questions, uh, we've already shared uh, the questions that were submitted during registration uh, to Dr. Schwinard. We've, uh, oh, there will be time for additional questions during the Q&A section of this uh, presentation. So please feel free to submit your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, a reminder, there is a Q&A box and a chat box. Uh, please do submit your questions in the Q&A section specifically. And now without further ado, I will hand this over to Dr. Schwinard. Thank you very much. I just need to, uh, to put my slide on. Sure. You know, Mel, we don't cannot, you, we, you know that Mel, we cannot do two things at the same time. <laughs> yes. It's, a, it's, a, it's an issue. Uh, thank you again for inviting me. And uh, just to let you know, I love those kind of uh, discussion because, you know, I, I'm usually the, the one who learned the more by the question of the patient. It's always a pleasure to uh, do those kind of talk. Today, you asked me to do a, a talk on blepharospasms. I'm going to try, I tried to figure what are the 10 most important questions that I'm going to try to answer. As you said, if people have questions, I'm going to be happy to answer the question. I, we have plenty of time to answer the question. And if there's anything, you can interrupt me as well. And uh, this is uh, my conflicts of interest. And the first question, obviously, is uh, and again, I know that it's a lot of people that do have dystonia. Some of the uh, things probably people will already know that. And uh, but other thing, I hope that uh, they will uh, I'll be able to teach uh, new information. What is blepharospasms and uh, it's weird because you would think that it's some things that we know from hundreds of years ago, but it's just been recently. It's only 45 years ago, and uh, I was born at that time when Dr. Marsden described it more carefully. Before that, we there was some question of eye blinking and uh, dystonia, but we didn't really know well what it was. And Dr. Marsden, 45, 45 years ago, did this paper. And it's from this paper that the entity was better described. At the beginning, we said that it was essential before spasms. 
we need to avoid to use essential. There's nothing essential about the blepharospasms. It doesn't mean anything. We need to focus more on focal dystonia if we want to say, uh, and if we want to use another term. But again, I don't think that we should use anymore the uh, essential blepharospasms. I said it, dystonia. What is dystonia? I know that it's uh, people that are very well educated on dystonia, but just to summarize it very briefly, dystonia is a movement disorder and it's it characterized by muscle contraction. And we usually, usually say, say that, sorry, that it will give you abnormal movement, abnormal posture, the blepharospasms, it's more the squeezing of the eyes. And again, the problem is in the brain. It's not the eyes, it's really into coming from the brains. And this Tonya has multiple faces. I took this picture from your, uh, your website and it's a really nice uh, website actually. I'm just doing some publicity here, but there's a lot of information for the patient. And there's many form of uh, dystonia. We're talking about the eyes one, I'm going to mention something about the lower face, but as you all know, the most frequent one is the cervical dystonia. You can also have dystonia, what we call the spasmodic dysmonia. And other dystonia are, uh, are not as frequent. It's the limb one. It's the rider's cramps that we can see. Those are all form of uh, dystonia. We're going to focus on the form that affect the eyes and the uh, cranial face. When we talk about the uh, nephrospasms, it's involuntary spasms of the muscle around the eyes. That's what it is. But it's not only that. You can have either a, what we say in our uh, vocabulary, in the medical term, it's the clonic, when you see the blinking. Some apraxia of eyelid opening. And I'm going to try to show you what it is. Actually, it's the failure to open the eyes. People were going to ask them to open the eyes rapidly and they will have difficulty. You will see the eyebrows going up. That's what this video is trying to show. Those are all symptoms of uh, lepharospasm. As you see, the lady is trying to open her eyes, but she cannot open the eyes. Sometimes as uh, it was shown here, it will use her hand to open the eyes. That's another symptom of uh, blepharospasm. At the early stage, it could be only blinking. People, you'll notice only blinking. That's essentially what it is. But as you can, uh, as you know, there's much more. One of the things that is very common, it's the sensory symptoms. People that are coming in my office always say it's burning. It's, there's some sensation around the eyes and it's quite frequent that people will experience this uh, sensation. And sometimes they won't recognize the, the spasms and they're gonna be seen by ophthalmologists or even their general practitioner because what they're gonna complain is this burning sensation. And they don't, they haven't noticed the involuntary movement. It's only when you examine them that you will notice that they blink quite a lot. We're, dis we're gonna discuss a little bit more of the photophobia. It's the light sensitivity. You asked me to discuss that. The other things that it's quite, uh, it's quite, uh, that will often have with dystonia, it's well, what we call the sensory trick, the geste antagonist in French. It's very peculiar to, and it's very, it's some things that you see only in dystonia. It's those kind of gesture that will, you'll do that will counteract the involuntary movement. The most frequent one is just to press on the temple and the eye will open. And that it's quite, it's some things that we see only in uh, dystonia, 
And it's some things that sometimes when, when we're not sure if it's dystonia, if someone tell you that by just pressing somewhere, it opened the eyes, it will help us as a physician to make the diagnosis because we don't see that in other condition. That's the uh, sensory trick. The other things that are not part of the motor symptoms, but are the non-motor symptoms that we can see in, uh, in uh, blepharospasms. It's sometimes people with dystonia, and I know that uh, Dr. Martino uh, presented on that topic, but there's often some psychiatric symptoms that are that will be part of the uh, the uh, disease or the spectrum of disease. People with different spasms are more prone to depression, and are more prone to obsessive compulsive disorder. And I have to say that uh, doctors you know, were not always good uh, to detect those symptoms. And uh, I know that my colleagues is uh, very keen of finding a way to. Uh, to better understand and better identify those symptoms that sometimes could be as, as important as the motor symptoms in uh, dystonia. Uh, dystonia to the eyes can spread. Actually, dystonia to the eyes has a more tendency to spread that other uh, kind of dystonia. When we say it's spread, it's, it can involve the, the eyes. Sometimes it's, it's going to involve the jaw. I like to uh, practice in the morning my dystonia when I, in my mirror. Then you can have the jaw opening or even the jaw closing. So, sometimes it can even spread to uh, affect uh, the neck. And usually, though, it's spread during the five, five, uh, within the five uh, first year. What is MESH? I said that there's a lot of uh, French people that are uh, that are attending this talk today. And uh, Henri MESH was a French neurologist that described ticks. And uh, we gave the name of uh, the MESH syndrome in honor to this uh, neurologist. MESH means that you have dystonia that affect your eyes and lower face. And it's a segmental dystonia. When we say it's a Maya syndrome, you have to have both. And this is a painting as well from uh, Brugel, who uh, we always say that this painting represents someone with a uh, Maya syndrome. Who's affected? Uh, dystonia, blepharospas can happen at all age. I am even have children with uh, blepharospasms. Usually when you're uh, younger, you tend to have a more generalized dystonia. But on average, we say that it, it affects more female than male. We, it said to uh, 2000 case diagnosis in the United States every year. But to be honest with you, in dystonia, we don't really know what is the incidence and prevalence uh, of this uh, disorder. By doing uh, this talk, I learned something. Menopause can uh, be a factor that uh, predisposed to blepharospasms in women. We know that hormone has some effect in uh, dystonia. Some people that are coming to my office will tell me that uh, when they're uh, during their period, they will notice a worsening of uh, dystose, the, the dystonia. We know that the hormone level can affect the uh, dystonia. What is the cause? If I knew the answer, I wouldn't be here today. The answer, the simple answer is that we don't really know what caused dystonia. Uh, in our uh, vocabulary, we always say idiopathic dystonia, meaning that we don't really know. But we do know that the problem is in the brain. And in a very specific part of the brain that we call the basal ganglia, that's what we're seeing on this uh, picture. The basal ganglia are structures that are right in the middle of the brain and that are controlling the, the movement. 
And it's the network in the brain that is not going well in dystonia. Then some uh, mismatch in the, uh, the network and muscle that are not supposed to be contracting, they're contracting. That is what is dystonia. The big question, the $1 million question is why there's this mismatch and why is the brain not functioning well? We think that it could probably be related to some genetic problem because a lot of people with dystonia have a family history of, uh, of uh, dystonia. A quarter of people that we'll see with uh, blepharospasms will have a family history of uh, dystonia or tremor. That's another possibility. And we know there's a lot of genes that have been detected that cause uh, dystonia, but there's no one genes that have been detected only for blepharospasms. That doesn't exist. There's no gene that has been discovered that only give people uh, blepharospasms. We know also that in some patients, a brain injury, drugs, or even infection can cause dystonia, but those are extremely, extremely rare. That's for the cause. It's very disappointing. I'm uh, hoping that before I retire, one day we'll know what is the real cause of uh, dystonia. Because why, why I'm saying that is if people die from this from something else in a car accident and they have dystonia, when we look at the brain, there is no lesion. It's not like Parkinson's disease where you can see lesion, which means that maybe since there's no lesion, it's giving me hope that at some point there's some chemical imbalance that we can better treat than, uh, and that people can be uh, Pure from uh, dystonia. You see, I'm very hopeful today. It's, uh, it's one of those days. I have a oh, question, Dr. Martinez, yes. if you don't mind, on the previous slide. Uh, um, yes. I was uh, just checking my understanding. You said that uh, you see about a quarter of the population with blepharospasm have some form of genetic dystonia, but there is no gene detected yet for blepharospasm. Yes. There, there's a couple of genes that have been detected for uh, dystonia but that's extremely rare. And uh, we haven't found one genes that will give you only the heterospasms. Got it. And one of the reason it's the, uh, did I answer your question? Yes, yes. You did. Yeah. One of the reason is that we don't have a uh, better way of making a diagnosis of dystonia or blepharospasms than by examining the patient. It's not like we could take a blood and say, you've got dystonia, or we can do a CT scan or an MRI and say you have dystonia. Dystonia is a clinical diagnosis. And that's one of the reason why people that are coming in my office, they often say that it's been there for many years, but no one were able to make the diagnosis. It takes long, especially for blepharospasms, but it's true also for uh, neck dystonia. Sometimes it takes very long for the doctor or the general practitioner to make the diagnosis. And uh, that's because we don't, and that's also what makes research difficult. It would be much easier if we can do a brain scan and say, this guy has dystonia and we can look at everybody that has the same image and it would make the research to find the genes much, uh, more, uh, much more efficient. The other thing that I can add on that, it most likely that you can have a genes that will make you prone to dystonia, but there's gonna be other factor that can trigger it, which means that you can carry the genes but if you're not exposed, sometimes it's a trauma it could, and other reason that will trigger the dystonia. And I'm saying that just to make you understand why it's difficult sometimes to make a diagnosis and why it's not always easy. But when you see the neurologist, that's what he's gonna ask you when it started, what our body affected, then uh, what would make it worse and uh, make it better. What can cause uh, dystonia besides uh, 
eye, uh, what can cause eye blinking besides dystonia? And uh, probably one of the most frequent uh, reason is the, uh, if you have other uh, ocular condition, sometimes you will be prone to blink. And uh, that's gonna make you blink and it's not dystonia, it's just because you have other condition. Mm, uh, being exposed to light, it's, uh, it can make you blink as well. Some people are more prone. This is my dog and we'll discuss my dog later on but uh, who I put in front of the sun and he started to uh, blink. And uh, I don't think my dog has dystonia. Although I would like to say that he has dystonia, but I don't think he has dystonia. And photosensitivity, it's another uh, way of uh, getting a dystonia. And one of the biggest error, it's people with tick disorder. And probably ticks, is the differential the diagnosis that is the most mixed missed by doctor because ticks can present the same way than uh, blepharospasms and we tend to say that ticks start at early age but now we know that uh, ticks can uh, even start when you're not as younger and there's a lot of overlap between tick disorder and uh, dystonia and if I show you this video, there's no way you can say just by looking at this person if he has dystonia or if he has a tick disorder. There's only one thing that could help you. Ticks, we usually say that you can suppress it. People that are blinking and because of ticks, they can suppress it. But dystonia is much more difficult to suppress. But even though, Having said that, again, I think that uh, what I learned over the year is that there's a lot of overlap and there's a lot of people that are sent to me for blepharospasms, which as uh, in fact, they have ticks. And uh, one of the thing that I learned again with my gray hair is that ticks are much more difficult to treat than uh, blepharospasms. And sometimes I would even say, and maybe my colleagues wouldn't agree with me, that when people, they don't respond well to toxin injection, you have to worry about, could it be something else? And this something else could be a tick disorder. And if there's more question uh, later on, I can extend on that. Other things that are often believed to be dystonia, there's the myokemia, but that's something different. It's the, I didn't, Find a video, but it's the uh, shivering that you see under your eyes. A lot of people got that once in their life, and sometimes they're sent to me for this. But this is most of the time normal. We see that in uh, with fatigue. The other things that is often thought they are refer for blepharospasms. It's the hemifacial spasms, which is much different. It's the uh, blepharospasms is both eyes facial, as it said, it's only one eyes. And that's the other cause of, uh, of uh, blepharospasm. You can have uh, eye dystonia in other neurological disorder, but that's going to be easy because they, they're going to have other symptoms. You can have part of uh, Parkinson's disease. A lot of patients that are coming to see me, they were diagnosed with myasthenia. Myasthenia, it's a problem, a neurological problem of the muscle, which will make your eyes droop. And uh, the, uh, sometimes it's a misdiagnosis of uh, dystonia. How do we treat it? The treatment, there's, when we discuss treatment, there's the pharmacological treatment, surgical treatment, and there's the non-pharmacological treatment. Dry eyes is quite uh, it's quite uh, frequent. Lens sensitivity it's probably uh, the worst one of the worst symptoms because I don't know uh, probably not in France as much as in uh, Quebec or in, in Ontario but this time of the year it's the worst time of the year for blepharospasms because of the snow. The bright uh, light and the snow make you have a lot of uh, photophobia. And uh, that's not a good time. Uh, it's uh, 
the other thing is uh, there's glasses that can help you. And there's even one that has been studied more than the other one. It's the FL41, it's the pinky one. And it's even better when it goes around your eyes as well. That sometimes can uh, minimize the, uh, and uh, it's funny because today, before uh, before this talk, some people were uh, just go, we came in my office with those glasses. I mean, and they found by themselves that this kind of glasses they're very good to prevent this uh, dystonia, and this often they have to wear it uh, at home as well. Reduce stress. We'll discuss that a little bit in more detail. How do we treat it? Oral medication. We have nothing. We were discussing together before this uh, talk research. There's a huge, tremendous lack of research on dystonia. We need to do some things. We don't have good uh, medication for dystonia. There's only very old medication that have been studied when I was uh, doing my fellowship many, many years ago. And there's not that many new uh, medication that have been studied and nothing aiming at treating only the uh, blepharospasms. I mean, I put the name of those drugs and, uh, but there's not that much and we need to figure better drug for dystonia. What we learned over the year is that we need to treat also the non-motor symptoms. I said that already two times, depression, anxiety needs to be treated. Sometimes we can improve our patient much more by treating the non-motor symptoms than treating the motor symptoms. And we need to keep this in mind all the time. One of the best treatment for focal dystonia, everybody that is attending this uh, discussion today probably knows that there's uh, the best treatment, it's, uh, it's toxin, botulinic, botulinum toxin. In Canada, we have three kind of toxin. Uh, there never been study head to head, and uh, I think that uh, they're all good to uh, treat the blepharospasms. And the good thing is that with toxin, we say that in ninety percent of the time we have some uh, good uh, result. And uh, we can discuss toxin later on, but uh, it's uh, I call it the art of toxin injection. This is the point that where we can inject toxin, there's plenty of point and uh, everybody has his own recipe. I think that there's as many recipes as a neurologist or ophthalmologist that inject the, uh, the eyes. Uh, sometimes we are doing uh, miracles. Sometimes we're not as good as the other doctor. We learned that the closer to the eye, or blepharospasms, maybe it's better and less side effects. Again, this is has changed. I changed my pattern of, of injection by learning from my colleague, learning from other people over the years. But usually it's, uh, it's those kind of uh, injection point. Toxin, usually they start after two to three days and they last uh, about two to three months. Uh, Possible side effects. It's uh, it's uh, it's the most frequent one is the one that we show here. It's the uh, black eyes. It happens. If I can find a way of uh, preventing it, one day I will be very happy. There's no way to. Uh, often it's people that are taking a uh, drug blood thinner, but it could happen even with blood thinner. You can have because of the injection doses. It's the uh, drooping of the eyelid. Uh, this we learned over the year that there's drops that can, uh, I gave the name of the drop. And there's even some small study that those drops for people that are very bad blepharospasm can be used sometimes. You should talk about those uh, with your doctor. Dryness of the eyes, blurred vision, double vision are all side effect of the uh, toxin. What I learned from uh, over the years by treating uh, blepharospasm and dystonia, it's you need to be humble. We don't know everything. Sometimes we do good. Sometimes we can be better. 
we learn from our mistake and uh, sometimes it can take many trials before you get the right dose with blepharospasms i learned that you need to be aware of the pain a lot of people have pain burning eyes that we need to address uh, things that have changed and i've said that many times over the years we were very strict with the uh, interval between the dose we usually say it's three months and there is no scientific reason for that some people it doesn't last as long as three months some people that i will be injecting every two months and we need to be to listen to the patient okay and uh, some i mean in in some remote region you don't have access as often to your neurologist but some people it make the big difference when we do it every two months uh, we keep learning uh, if so if it doesn't respond as i said before you can reconsider your diagnosis and uh, the other thing is that uh, at the beginning when i was very young we used to worry about antibodies those are the fact that when you do give injection over and over your body seems will react to the uh, to the uh, toxin and it won't work we don't see that anymore the, uh, we used to see that before, but all the company purified the uh, toxin. Uh, it's extremely rare that you'll see that uh, more. The other thing that I didn't put there is to treat headache. That's I learned over the year. Toxin is very good to treat headache. And in my practice, almost 30% of the people that I treat for blep or neck dystonia, I will also give them toxin injection for the headache and uh, it helped quite a lot surgery surgery it's reserved to people that are fully responsive to toxin injection or that are and that are very disabled by uh, dystonia if you cannot drive because of the dystonia it's uh, it could be a reason and if you don't respond well to uh, toxin it's uh, it could be a reason the problem with surgery, and I am going to be uh, saying it uh, very uh, honestly, is that there is not that much study on it. And uh, actually, that's a recent paper last year that has been done, and I find that it's a very good paper on all, and this is all kind of procedure that you can do for blepharospasms. And overall, it could be helpful but sometimes people could uh, could uh, experience worsening after the surgery and they can even uh, and they often they will need in one third of the the case they will still need some uh, toxin injection after the surgery i would love to say that surgery is the answer but i don't think that in 2022 we can uh, we can say that surgery could be good surgery could be good for people that are not responding well to uh, medication but we need to be better in doing surgery and again i said it many times already we need to do more research we need to help people with uh, with uh, blepharospasms how do we cope with it and i think that I, i'm more i passed my uh, 20 minutes but i'm gonna be uh, actually I think that people are going to tell me today how do we, we cope with it. I don't think I'm the best person to uh, tell you how to cope with it. I can just tell you what I learned from uh, my patient because I think that treating dystonia, it's a team effort. It's the patient and it's the doctor. It has to be a team effort. And I don't have any secret. I don't have any secret uh, recipe to tell you because that was the title of my uh, presentation how to cope but uh, again it's more of the people that were are going to tell me how to cope what they learn and what are the the things that are working well for them some people will tell me it's yoga some people are going to tell me it's meditation there's probably plenty of things that could help you one of the good things 
that happen with those things. There's a lot of bad thing with cell phone or, but one of the good thing is that we knew we do have camera now and uh, it's, uh, it's useful to take selfie. It's useful to take selfie of uh, your eye when you have side effects. It's useful to take a selfie to show me how the injection went and you can send it by email. This, we didn't have that before. That's very helping. Keep a diary of uh, your symptoms. Calm your eye uh, spasms. Some people will use the sensory trick. They will use a, a tight baseball cap that's gonna help them. Uh, eye mask. Uh, those are changing of the lightning of your computer, the lightning in your house that have always a bright light. Those are the tricks that can help you to cope with uh, blepharospasms. Some uh, eye scrub can uh, help, but be careful not to scrub your eyes after the injection because that could make the uh, toxin spread and uh, it can give you uh, side effects. What is the latest in research? We, and you asked me the question about genes. Every month or every year, there's plenty of genes. And I think it's a good news, but uh, as I said before, we, uh, we still need to do more research on the genes, on the cause, on the overall medication, on the toxin, on the surgery. I already mentioned that. Just to show you, there's our, those are three toxins that are coming and uh, that are in study. Some are longer duration which would be very nice because it's not easy to come to see the doctor every three months. If we can have a toxin that lasts longer, that could be very nice. Some are the toxins that are acting much rapidly. Some are already prepared. And, uh, but their study, we still need to find a, some better toxin. Positive attitude. That's very difficult in those and the, with the COVID time. It's, uh, I find it's, uh, I'm just gonna share things with you today. It's the worst time of my life in terms of treating dystonia because everybody is tired of the situation. Everybody is looking forward to have, uh, being able to go outside, meet people. Even the doctor, they're all tired. We need to, uh, that's the, uh, and that's why we need to take care of ourselves. It's, uh, it's the best time right now to take care of ourselves, to make times to, uh, to put some humor in your life. It's, uh, it's going to pass. I'm hopeful, and I always say that in the next three weeks, it's going to be over. I try to have a very positive attitude, but this is a very difficult time. And during the winter also, it's uh, here in Quebec, it's like uh, we, it's freezing like we never had before and people are inside. That's why we need to uh, figure a way to take care of our, uh, ourselves. We need to do exercise. We need to do, some people will find meditation, as I said before, yoga, training. It's, uh, it's what we can do to, uh, to help us sleep well, but even, if I say sleep well, everybody is not sleeping well lately. We have we're living very uh, stressful uh, time in our life, but we need to take care of us ourselves. We need to take care of everybody else. Uh, thank you. I showed you my uh, dog before. That's a uh, Charcot Chaco for the uh, and Chaco is a uh, is a uh, training right now. Uh, he's uh, coming with me to the office because uh, I'm training him to help me to do the toxin injection. It's, uh, and uh, I'm saying that because some people that are coming to see me, they might see uh, the dog uh, in the next uh, few months uh, who's coming. Uh, it's my new helper. I'm, uh, I, I took more than uh, 20 minutes. Uh, chocolate is good. People, the, my patient knows that before the pandemic, so I usually give chocolate. And uh, we need, and if you, and if you have recipe for that, we need to live one day at a time. If we can just learn that, and that's probably the most difficult thing to learn, but if we can live one day at a time, that's gonna make our life uh, much easier. Again, I'm gonna stop. 
my uh, that's uh, the fun part is starting for me because now I'm going to get the uh, the question and uh, that's the part that I like the most. And I see that there's Q and A. Great. Uh, I I'm, I will. I'll share my screen again. Before we start with the questions, Dr. Srinath, I just wanted to go over some supports for yes. the community. And I will do that quickly here. Uh, by the way, I have to say it was a very informative uh, presentation, uh, Dr. Srinath. Knowledge is always key and I learned so much. And I'm sure I think uh, this recorded presentation will be a good reference for us to go back to and, and check information. And uh, you've given uh, quite a lot of information for, uh, uh, I would say, the community to think about and also ask uh, their doctors when uh, uh, they go seek their treatment or even take into consideration things that they may never have. So thank you. Um, I quickly want to run through some of the supports that we have on our website. One is our support group network, which uh, we're very grateful to have uh, uh, this is uh, our volunteers across Canada. Um, I see um, they, they host uh, meetings uh, online, unfortunately, at this point or at this moment. So please do check our website uh, for any upcoming meetings. Um, we do have one specific uh, uh, blood work spasm support meeting coming up on February 5th. There'll be details later. And we also have this web page called the forward slash bluffer spasm web page. Some of the resources are listed here, but it's a very informative um, uh, web page. And I would have to uh, thank the BEBCRF uh, Foundation who shared this information, as well as our sister organization in the States, the DMRF, who have allowed us to share information on this page. Uh, this The recorded uh, webinar will also be uh, placed on this page later. Um, and here is the support meeting I was talking about. It's going to be uh, facilitated by a wonderful uh, and very dedicated uh, volunteer, Robin. Uh, it's on February 5th. Please do sign up. It's on the website. It's on the same web page. And there we are. We're at the, uh, the part that everyone has been waiting for and Dr. Shwinard has been waiting for. So for the most part, you've answered all of the questions. I'm just going to go through some of those that weren't addressed. So um, you mentioned a uh, bluffer spasm and ptosis. And what I understand is the ptosis is the uh, symptom or is, is an after effect? Is that what it is? If you can just uh, clarify. Ptosis, it's, it's a weakness of the eyelid, okay? And uh, sometimes it's because of the spreading of the toxin, okay? And usually it happens after a couple of days after the injection, and you'll see that the eyes will close. And that's why the drops, the atroconidine drops, often help. They will open the eyes, and we can use that uh, during the time that this effect uh, is there. But with time, sometimes days, weeks, it's going to go over. But if it happens, you need to be very careful that your eyes is closing well as well during the night because you don't want to your pillows to rub on your eyes if your eyelid is not closed. Thank you. Um, the next question I have is, um, it's a specific question. It's about uh, twin RICS vaccinations. Um, and this person uh, got blepharospasm right after it. Have you heard of anyone else whose blepharospasm started like this? Uh, no. There's no, uh, there's no, I mean, it's difficult to say if there's related. It's, uh, but uh, uh, we don't know any, I've never seen any case of uh, the first pass as triggered by vaccination. We do have um, a general uh, question or a common misunderstanding of if vaccine induced dystonia cause dystonia. It's on our website. Please do check that. Um, uh, this one might be a bit uh, uh, of a, a difficult one. It's how do you deal with extreme exhaustion? How do, sorry, I missed up. How do you deal with extreme exhaustion with blepharospasm? Uh, it's, uh, it's some things that I hear sometimes. Uh, it's very difficult uh, because it's uh, it can 
because by many other factors, uh, we always, when I hear that, uh, that people are very tired, I need to figure if there's anything else that can trigger it. Is there a medication? Are people, and that's something that I forget to mention, sleeping in Estonia can be affected. And sleeping, it's probably one of the most important things. We need to figure if people have some sleeping uh, problem because that could be help. And, and the treatment that I, and it's counterintuitive, but sometimes exercise will help you and uh, could help you with that. But I don't have any magical tricks though. Thanks, Dr. Trinard. Um, a lot of the questions are about coping, which you've already talked about. Um, you need oh. coping. Let, let me, okay, let, let's stay on coping. Uh, you can tell that you have dystonia even though it's difficult sometimes. And, uh, but it's the same for, uh, the more you try to, to prevent it, the more energy it takes you and the more tired you're gonna be. Uh, in, uh, that's why sometimes by telling that you do have a medical condition and I understand that's not easy one. But someone could this could help you. Someone people sometimes are afraid of uh, of uh, telling that they have a condition, but uh, maybe it could help you to cope with it. It's um, yeah, that's a good point. It's also Bell. Let's talk day today. <laughs> yeah. And they encourage you to talk about your. It's it's, it's about mental health. I I would say applies everywhere. <laughs> I, I, I we are we should all be able to tell because it's uh, again I think that we're living a different uh, different difficult times and we need to be able to express our emotion and it's not an easy one it's easy to say but it's not an easy one absolutely okay. um, another question is um, does brain training work and is it common for spasms to occur in the neck when the eye muscles inactivated by Botox Oh, that might be separate questions. Uh, brain training, uh, that's a good question. Uh, and you see, uh, one of the general things that I would say is that doctors, sometimes they're not uh, fun, not fun, it's not the right term in English, but uh, they like to have study. Uh, it's the way our brain is working. We have a very uh, systematical brain and uh, we uh, we like to have double blind study to say that something is working. That's the way we were taught. Uh, and uh, sometimes there's no study, but some people find that some of the exercise and brain training could help. And uh, if it helps you, it helps you. That's at the end, that's the most important things. But I just want to make this general because I might have question about any kind of uh, acupuncture, any other kind of uh, intervention. And sometimes they work. And the other thing is that we don't know everything. And there's things that might be working. And uh, even if there's no good study, it might be working. Brain training, we don't have any reason in dystonia to believe that brain training so far has some effect on the uh, dystonia. Uh, about the next spasm, sometimes when we treat some people, they have eyes and I said it could spread to the next and some people, they will, they could have some next spasms because of the dystonic, dystonia that affect the next or because of the way they are always putting their head to prevent the closure or reacting to the closure. That could be another reason as well. Okay. We've, we've got a couple of questions of uh, what are uh, treatments other than uh, neurotoxin or botulinum toxin if it doesn't work for them? Yeah, we mentioned the surgery and we mentioned the medication. 
but again, the best one is uh, what I didn't mention today, and I forget, and I or maybe it was in my slide, is that there's other kind of surgery. I'm, I put some emphasis on the eye surgery, but there's also the brain stimulation that sometimes could be uh, used for dystonia when nothing else working. But there's deep brain stimulation. It's usually used for more generalized dystonia. And we don't have very good study just for the, uh, when you have uh, eye uh, dystonia. Eyes is easy to, it's easy. It's easier to treat. But sometimes when there is jaw dystonia involved, the what was the so-called mesh syndrome, mesh is much more difficult to treat because the, the muscles are less accessible and some muscles are can give you more side effects. Again, I mean, and there's all the other things that you can do in your life to help you to cope or deal with uh, dystonia. I'm, I'm going to uh, check the chat box now. Uh, or sorry, yeah, the Q and A some box. of the question, yeah, in the chat box. Uh, so the first one was uh, someone mentioned that uh, they have the first spasms, but they all they also have some uh, vocal uh, cord uh, dystonia, Disorder. and that that could happen. Again, it's all this concept of spreading of the uh, involuntary movement. It could affect your eyes, but it can migra migrate to your jaw. And sometimes it can migrate to your vocal cord. That could be uh, that could be something that is part of this dystonia uh, syndrome. Uh, there's a question of uh, if the Botox and uh, and uh, Zomin, which are two kind of uh, toxin, stop working. Uh, is, is it likely then this port uh, may work? There's no rational for that. Okay, there is no rational to say that one toxin is better than the other one. If someone would be telling me that they tried two toxin and it doesn't work, zero yet, what to do? I would wonder if this person has some antibodies, which means that the uh, and there's an easy way to figure that is we put some toxin in the foreheads, and uh, if people they don't uh, they don't have weakness it means that uh, they have antibodies and uh, you can try with as many toxins as you want you will never respond to it uh, one of the question was if is blepharospasm the same as imifacial spasms we answer the question mm -hmm. two different medical condition and the easiest way to figure it out is that imifacial it's only with one side of the face uh, and uh, could it? And I'm going to answer this question more uh, general. General uh, answer is: Could it improve in one eye? I would say: Could could dystonia improve? Dystonia, as I mentioned before, and uh, maybe I didn't put enough emphasis. Dystonia acts strangely sometimes. Some people can have even, uh, and that's another question. It, they can even be cured. And there's what we call remission of dystonia. It's very rare, but it could happen that you can have a remission. And if I knew how could it be, I will certainly be very rich because I would love to uh, retire and do something else than treat uh, dystonia. And, but it could happen that it improved. It's rare. The question was one eye could one eye improve? It's possible. Everything is possible but it's extremely rare. The other um, question, is, yes, sorry. Oh, I was going to ask it, or you can read it, that's fine. Either way yeah. works. Uh, could drugs can uh, cause uh, dystonia? There's drug, the, uh, it's usually medication that we use to treat a psychiatric disorder. What in our, uh, what we will call neuroleptics that can give you blepharospasms. There's even a name, it's called tardive blepharospasms. And the, the, the person asked me if the uh, antidepressant drug can cause uh, blepharospasms. This is less clear. I mean, uh, SSRI, there's been some case 
uh, but we're not sure at 100% that uh, it is really uh, the cause. Mm -hmm. There was, uh, there was one uh, question from a medical professional, I believe, and it was, how do we in oral health care need to accommodate patients with MASH syndrome? How do, sorry, I missed um, it. How do professionals in oral health care In oral? Health care. Uh, but what do you mean oral uh, health care? I'm guessing someone uh, who- A dentist uh, or- Dentist yeah. or someone, yes. That's yeah, right. uh, that's, a, that's a good question because it's, uh, because we we put a lot of emphasis of nephrospasm, but as we say, it's often affect the lower face. And some people will even go to uh, see the dentist because they will have those spasms and uh, the diagnosis won't be uh, as well recognized. And there's things that can be done by the surgeon. And uh, we know that uh, we can even inject some of the lower face uh, muscle. But it's probably the, the simple answer is probably a team effort. We need to work all together. And sometimes I will refer to uh, oral specialists it's, uh, or surgeon or dentist to help me some uh, with, uh, with things that uh, they know better than me. Um, I, I've got, I got this question from a few people uh, before is, um, uh, can their eye doctor also detect uh, blepharospasm uh, or diagnose them? Yes, yes, they can certainly, but it's like a neurologist. They need to be aware of it. They need to be thinking of it. I'm pretty sure that if we uh, would ask a patient today, a lot of them probably went to see a ophthalmologist before somewhere this the diagnosis with uh, dry eyes and uh, it wasn't as uh, easy uh, to uh, to uh, make the diagnosis and uh, but yes the the uh, ophthalmologist can make the diagnosis and yes some are even treating it with toxin as well um you probably answered this about surgery, but uh, in in some uh, one specific surgery, I think uh, that you were talking about, uh, other than DBS uh, or maybe even DBS, how effective is the surgery, and what would the cost range? Is some uh, someone's asking? I guess this is yeah. Some, uh, yeah, it's something some that I, yeah I answered that it's effective, but there's still. Uh, maybe a third of the patient that will need to keep having the toxin injection. Extremely rarely people will get worse after the surgery. That's why we need to make sure at 100% that the, uh, the toxin injection are not giving a, enough uh, uh, improvement before we consider the surgery. But it, and it's an evolving field. I mean, uh, 10 years ago, they were doing maybe the stripping. Some now they are doing it uh, and they are learning. And uh, it's getting much better than it was before. But we still need to, uh, to uh, work on that. Uh, um, we have a few more questions. I think we've answered most of, uh, or you've answered most of them. Well, this one, yeah, I believe, there was is a question not on the different, uh, the different uh, type of toxin again. As far as I'm concerned, I, I wouldn't say today that there's one that are better than the other one. Um, can you have isolated jaw clenching and uh, lip quivering is one question. Uh, yes, uh, but it's uh, difficult to answer that question uh, because you can have the jaw clenching, but uh, it depends. It's uh, This is the kind of thing you need to examine and better understand what the person mean, but uh, it could. Um, uh, someone's talked about, they had uh, eyelid surgery uh, two years ago and uh, they find that the um, botulinum toxin injections are more painful and uh, less effective after. After the surgery? Yes. Yeah, it's some things that I miss that, but I, I something that people will tell me that they find that it's a, it's much more painful I, after the surgery. 
because uh, the the first of all we we went to uh, to do some scar in that region and they could be painful but there's way and i use it we most of the doctor you don't, don't use it but you can always put amla free before the injection some people find that it's helping some people don't find that it makes a big difference it's to try to numb the skin some people uh, there's been study with ice but uh, ice is not easily available although in quebec right now everything is icy but uh, that's other way of doing it well thanks thanks so much for answering those questions dr Schwinard.